Okay, thanks very much for that. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Excellent. Okay, uh, thanks very much for coming in today. Talk about how to get the best AppSec test for your life. Um, so I know it's the last session, everyone's very tired. I'm going to get you to move just a little bit. Um, I've got a question to start off with. Um, usually you start off with, who am I? I'm going to ask, who are you? Okay, I want to know who's sitting here today. So if you mostly identify with being a builder, if someone who builds software, please can you put your hand up? Someone who builds software as their main job or their main interest? Okay, you can put your hands down. If you're a defender, someone who works internally at the company, securing software, making sure your software is secure, put your hands up. Okay. Uh, and if you're a breaker, someone who goes in and breaks other people's software for a living. Okay. Okay, so that's about what I'd expect based on how I pitched the talk. Um, so we'll come back to that in a second. So what I mean when I say AppSec test, just because it's a little bit of an overloaded term. So I'm not talking here about DAS, DAST, IAST, um, these automated tools that will go in and automatically find out vulnerabilities from your code. Um, I'm talking about TANAST, which is an acronym I just made up, um, standing, standing for Tool Assisted Manual Application Security Testing. So that's man against machine, me sat down working on the application, testing the application, trying to find vulnerabilities. Um, these are obviously great tools, the DAS, the SAS, but they're not going to find everything. They're not going to replace a human being thinking about, okay, how could this go wrong? How can I make this go bad? Um, so, ooh, not moving, not moving. Here we go. So, okay, we want to get the best. How are we going to get the best? Well, if, if I'm a breaker and I want to think about, okay, what ideas have I got to deliver a really good pen test? There are loads of really great ideas on the internet. I may have stolen one of their talk titles from my own. There are loads and loads of great resources out there about how to give a better pen test. What about the defenders? What about the builders? What resources are there to get a better test, to receive a better test? There wasn't much there, not that I saw. So I decided that I was going to write a talk trying to bring some ideas together. So now, who am I? Where's this come from? So I've been a consultant for over a decade, starting in IT risk and specializing in IT security, then specializing in application security. Uh, I'm currently working as a team leader for ComSec Global, which is an uh, AppSec consultancy, largest consultancy based out of Israel, with offices in Europe as well, but clients on all around the world. And what that means is I've seen clients in all sorts of industries, all sorts of application sizes, all sorts of levels of maturity. And it means I've got lots of ideas about what can go right, what can go wrong, and how we can really get the best value out of this AppSec process, the AppSec testing process, because it's what I'm seeing day in, day out. Um, I'm also one of the organizers of AppSec Israel, very large uh, regional conference based in Israel. Uh, it's free. We had 700 people there last month. Um, I'd very much recommend you all to check it out. So what do we want to do today? So my main goal is that everyone here should get something out of this. I don't think every idea here will be relevant to every person here, but I'm hoping that everyone will get something out of it, um, mostly if you're a defender or a, build or a builder. If you're a breaker, then hopefully you can think about, you know, can you deliver tests that offer extra value? Uh, questions we can do at the end. So why should anyone care? Why, why should we care about getting more value out of this process? Uh, I went around the Sponsors Expo yesterday, and I spoke to some of the AppSec consultancies there. And I asked them, you know, what do you do? We help, we help our customers to, with secure architecture, or we help them to build software more securely. And I said, OK, well, what's the split between Um, and the architecture side. And they sort of undenied and said, yeah, it's mostly the penetration testing stuff. It's mostly the hands-on testing. Ultimately, everyone's already doing it. And if we're already doing it, let's try and make sure we get it right. Let's try and do it as well as we can. How are we going to do it as well as we can? Ultimately, we're going to get out what we put into it in the first place. If we put good quality meat in, we'll get good quality sausage. And also, everyone's application is different. Everyone's company is different. Everyone's environment is different. And if we're going to get a cookie cutter test where we're not thinking about it beforehand, then we're not getting the right level of value from the test. So where can we do this? So I've, I've split the ideas into several stages. We've got the scoping stage, 
where we think about, okay, what, what do we want to test? What needs to be included? We've got the preparation stage where we're saying, okay, we know what we want to test. How, practically speaking, are we going to do it? And we've got the reporting stage, talking about, okay, what are we going to get out of this at the end? What's the feedback going to be? What's the output going to be? So three opportunities, five ideas for each. Um, let's dive in. So I very strongly believe that if you want to get the most value out, you need to take a transparent box approach. You can take an opaque box approach where the, the tester doesn't have a clue what's going on inside, or you can take a transparent box approach where the tester sees exactly what's going on. I had one of my colleagues come to me and he said, we need to test this client server application and it's communicating with the server, it's installed on a PC and it's encrypting its requests. But I don't think it's encrypting them right. I think it's storing a hard coded key. So he said, okay, I'm gonna disassemble the application, I'm gonna follow all the calls through, I'm gonna debug it until I find this encryption key. So I said to him, why don't you just ask the client? Ask them where the encryption key is. You could spend hours, days decompiling it just for this one thing. Or you can ask them, where's the encryption key? And then, if necessary, after that, go hands-on and find it yourself. But at least now you know what you're looking for. You know, we're not trying to emulate a realistic hacker here. We're not trying to spend weeks or months like a determined attacker might do. You know, if you want a realistic attack, go and insult Kim Jong-un, and you'll get a realistic attack. Um, what we're looking for here is value. We want to try and get the most coverage over the application, the highest possible quality, um, in the least possible time. So, how are you gonna find a tester? How are you gonna choose a tester? So I go through lots of scoping processes, lots of competitive bid processes, and the number one thing that I don't get asked is can we see an example report? Ask them for an example report, ask them for a sample. You wanna see what you're getting at the end of this. They can have very experienced testers, but if they can't present you with something that's useful at the end, then you haven't really bought anything. Something that's a useful thing you can do is prepare a spec up front. Say, okay, this is the application. This is the size of the application. This is what we're mostly concerned about. Um, otherwise, you're going to have long scoping calls with security testing companies where you answer the same questions over and over again. You also might end up getting different, uh, different proposals from different companies who've understood you differently. Um, if during that process you find someone you particularly like, you find a tester you feel like is really quite switched on, don't. Let, you know, say we want this guy to do it. Don't uh, go to the consulting company, say we want you, and then they send a completely different team. You know, be pushed back about it. So this is sort of a, a slightly weird point, um, but I think it does hold some value. If you work in, a, inside a company and you go to your boss and you say, look, we've got this security issue, it's quite concerning to me, we need to address it. Hopefully your boss is gonna say, yeah, yeah sure, we'll, we'll get on that, go, go and sort that out. But it's possible your boss will say, oh, we haven't got budget, or we haven't got time, or that's not a priority, or who are you and how did you get into my office? Um, and ultimately, you know, it, it depends on the organization. But if you come to your boss with a report that's nice and shiny, has come from an external consultant, and it's come from an expert because it's come from outside, depending on the company culture, they might be a lot more likely to listen to that, which isn't a great situation, but you can work it to your advantage. If you're discussing with the tester up front and you're doing the scoping process with the tester, you can explain to them, okay, these are the concerns we have internally. These are the main areas of we want to look at internally. And make sure that in the end report, they're going to appear there. Ultimately, it means that it's a benefit for the tester because they're providing something that's more focused, more suited to the company. And it's a benefit for you because you're getting your internal concerns addressed, albeit in a slightly roundabout way. And maybe even you look good because something you said two months ago has now come up on the uh, consultant's report. So if you ask, should we get the same person to do this each time or should we get someone else to do the test each time? Each time we're going to do a testing cycle. So I say it, it depends. I think there's a lot of value in the first few times you get the same tester to test the application. They, after the first time, they're going to understand it better. They're going to know what to expect. They're not going to have to learn the application from scratch every time. Um, but after several cycles, hopefully you're seeing that the number of vulnerabilities decreases, that the severity of vulnerabilities decreases, and you want to start seeing if someone with a fresh pair of eyes is going to start finding other stuff or have different ideas. The person who's been doing it previously might uh, themselves get preconceived ideas and, and think, okay, well, I've looked there before and it was fine last year, so I'm not going to look this year either. So I think there's definitely value. First few times, get the same person. After that, bring someone fresh in. 
So this is sort of a bare bones look at what you could do for a security testing project. I think that this is a little not enough. Um, I'd like to see something a little bit more like this, something that's a little bit more comprehensive, something that puts a little bit more thought into it and missing less opportunities. So we start off with scoping, just understanding what the test needs to be. We then go into the overview stage. So this isn't just the company throwing some credentials at the tester, throwing a link at the, at the tester, but rather get the, get the tester to sit down with the devs, sit down with the architects and really understand the application. What's going on behind the scenes? How do these modules fit together? What's going on inside each module? An experienced tester will already have feedback, will already have ideas of findings and suggestions for improvements just from that stage. And plus it means once we get onto the testing stage, the tester has a much better idea how the application works and they can test in a much more focused way. They can test in a much more informed way. They know what they're looking at. They know if they press this button, what's going to happen behind the scenes. Also, give te the tester access to the source code. If I'm a security tester and I'm I think there's a SQL injection vulnerability in this, t in this code. I can keep throwing payloads for hour after hour, tailoring the payload, seeing does that go through, does, that go, does this one go through? Or I can look at the code, I can see, okay, what payload's gonna work, I can craft the payload and demonstrate that it's vulnerable. And that's taking me a lot less time, and I can spend time looking at something else. Again, in keeping in with the transparent approach. So at this point, we've got to the reporting stage where Hopefully we've got a more, much more high value report already because the testers have, have a much better understanding of how the application works. So now, that's not the end. It's vital that both sides sit down, make sure the findings are fully understood, make sure the report is fully understood, and also get the testers involved in helping the developers to find solutions. You know, the testers seeing this day in, day out, they, they understand this vulnerability well, they should understand how to fix it as well. Um, and they can definitely add some value to the, the developer. I strongly suggest doing a retest afterwards just to make sure that you've covered off everything that has, that has been fixed correctly. And at that point, you can start thinking, okay, what's, what's the next? What do I want to do next time I have to come and test this application? Do I want to do the same thing again? Do I want to focus on a specific area? Um, I think it builds much more continuity, a much more ongoing process. You're not starting from scratch each time. Another idea, which isn't mine, but I like it enough that I wanted to bring it in anyway, from a guy called Harun Mir. It's called a zero-day card. So let's say I'm an application security tester and I find remote code execution in your application and now I'm set on your web server. Now let's say that I don't find that, but let's pretend for a second that I do. Let's play the zero-day card and say, okay, I found a zero-day in your server. Let's say that the framework that you use, there is a zero-day which allows remote code execution on the server, something like the Apache Struts vulnerability with Equifax. So now I'm set on the server, what can I get to? We had a client where we did something similar because this is a goal-based test. They'd asked us, can we get this particular piece of information on their network? So we said, okay, we'll, we'll test your network, we'll test your applications. They said, oh, there's no point testing the applications. They're in a DMZ. Um, you, can't get, they, you can't get inside from there. So we got ex code execution on the web server and we found out that the DMZ was set to pretty much any, any allow and we had access to their entire network. So it's definitely an addition, it's definitely something extra, but it's definitely something that adds that value of, okay, what's the real risk in this application? What can happen if suddenly there's a zero day in this application and it's exposed, the server's exposed? Okay, so that's the scoping stage. Let's move on to preparation. So, I'm not gonna dwell on this, but if you can catch low hanging fruit before the tester even comes in, and then the tester doesn't have to spend time finding it and writing it up, then that's obviously more time the tester spending on something else. Obviously, it does take up time and you may not have that bandwidth to address it though. So you've got your application, you've got your product, it's got a backlog with vulnerabilities in, as well as issues and upcoming features. If you know vulnerabilities in the application, tell the tester up front. There's no point in them spending time looking for the vulnerability and then reporting on the vulnerability if you already knew about it, you've not got any value from that. Tell them up front. Also, if you know there are areas you're more concerned about, you know that this area is brand new, it's never been tested, um, so you think it should have extra focus. If you know that all over your application you use a particular framework to protect yourself, but in this one place you can't use it because of a compatibility issue, and therefore you want them to focus on that. Um, again, we're looking for the efficiency, we're looking to make it as transparent to the tester as possible. So I call, I call this one 
security So there are lots of great technologies out there that will sit in front of your application and offer extra security protection. A uh, web application firewall or WAF is the, is the best example. Um, so those are great, but disable them all, whitelist your testers, so that make sure your testers testing the application and not just testing the security technology. Um, if necessary, afterwards, you can ask the tester to validate the findings with the technologies enabled. But you can, you can end up going down a bit of a rabbit hole with that. We had a client where we did just that. We tested without the WAF, and then we let them put the WAF back up again, and we validate, looked at the findings again. So we had an XSS finding. So they enabled the WAF. We send the XSS payloads, go straight through the WAF, hits the application, success. So we told the company. The company went to the WAF vendor. The WAF vendor had a look, and they said, oh, yeah, it turns out if you put a payload inside an array, inside an object inside another array, et cetera, then our, our WAF won't find it. But look, here, we've, we've, we've found this bug. We've now uh, pushed a fix, and you should try again. So we, we agreed to try again. So I send the same payload again. The WAF blocks it. I massively increased the size of the request, but left the payload the same, uh, the, pet the same. Sent a massive request to the WAF. The WAF went straight, went, went straight through the WAF, hits the application. We went back to the company, said, look, it got through the WAF again. They went back to the WAF vendor. The WAF vendor looked at it and said, oh, yeah, you've got uh, the WAF configured not to look at large requests. So they changed the configuration. I sent the large payload again. The WAF crashed. The WAF's gone. I try and access the application. The application's gone. I can't get it anymore. I ask a colleague at a different office with a different IP address, can you access the application? They can't access it either. So I go back to the company. The company go back to the WAF vendor. What does the WAF vendor say? Well, it blocked the attack. <laughs> Again, you can get into a bit of a rabbit hole with this sort of thing. Um, but if you want to get more advanced and you're more confident in your application, you can see, OK, what happens if we've got all the technologies enabled? Could anything happen with those technologies enabled? Is anything happening that's caused by those technologies that wouldn't happen if they weren't in place? We're seeing that rarely, but it can happen. But you've got to be, a lot, you've got to be pretty confident in your application before you start going down that, that route. Um, in terms of testing setup, if someone tells you, oh, this test will be 100% safe, don't need to worry about it, they're either bashing the application with a feather um, or they're not being honest with you. Ultimately, there's, there's always a risk that something might happen. Ultimately, we're always trying to make the application do something it wasn't supposed to do. We had a client where we sent a payload, very, very innocuous. It got transferred from one place to another, different module in the system. This module completely crashed based on this payload and took that whole module down. Suddenly, every user and every tenant of this application could no longer access this module. Now, we'd specifically asked to use a testing instance, so we hadn't done this to the production environment, otherwise everyone would have had a very bad day. Um, and because of this very reason, we try and suggest, look, use a dedicated environment for the tester, or at least something that's not production, something that's as close as possible to production, but it's not production, to reduce this risk. Um, also, let's use our, our laptops. We've got some companies who say, OK, we can't bring in any foreign workstations whatsoever, um, and we have to bring in tools, we have to start installing them. You lose a lot of momentum, you lose a lot of the efficiency. The worst case we have is one company where they bring us a fresh machine, we have to sanitize all our tools, we have to install all of our tools, and then they format the workstation at the end of the test, and we have to do it all over again next time. Again, it's um, loss, of, loss of efficiency. It's sort of difficult. I don't like to say it because it's a little bit obvious, but you have, to, you have to be ready. We find that the biggest loss of efficiency comes when suddenly we get to the date and something's not ready, something's not working. Um, agree a date with both sides. Get in writing from the tester what they need. Get the list, they need what do they need? They need URLs, they need users, they need whitelisting, and test it out front so that as soon as the tester gets in on day one, they're, already got a, they're starting at a running start, and they don't have to suddenly stop and find the client contact and find out why this doesn't work. Um, probably one of the more obvious points. Again, a ma major efficiency killer. OK, so that's the, the preparation stage. Let's talk a little bit about reporting. So first of all, I want to talk about reports as you go along. So we have some clients who insist on daily reports. Um, how's the testing going, and what's all the findings you've found so far? 
It means that basically the tester is stopping at some point in the afternoon and having to start thinking about, okay, what am I going to put in my daily reports? How am I going to make sure that the client's not going to get upset because they don't get the daily report? And it, again, it sort of distracts the tester and stops things from happening. I usually split progress reports into two sections, status and findings. For status, unless something's broken, unless it's not working, unless the tester can't proceed, there's nothing majorly valuable you need to know. Obviously, if the tester can't proceed that, you need to know ASAP. When it comes to findings, if you've got a critical finding, I define critical as remote code execution on the web server. SQL injection lets on pull all your data out. Uh, persistent XSS that's wormable. That's the sort of thing you need to know about immediately. That's the sort of thing you need to know about ASAP. For the others, I, st I strongly recommend holding off on waiting and getting the rest of the findings together. Often we'll find that a couple of findings together will alter the risk rating, alter the issue, the, le the level of severity of the finding. Uh, and if you get, start getting them drip fed through, you might not be getting the, the, the full picture. Um, whereas once they come in, in on a report, the testers had time to think about it, time to make sure, yeah, we've definitely set this out right and we've set it in the right context compared to the other findings. Having said that, informal communications are important. Tester, developer, you know, how does this work? What's going on here? I press this button and I get this result, does that sound sensible? You definitely want to promote that because that's going to help the tester get that better understanding and that's also going to help the developer understand, okay, well, this is what the tester's looking for. Maybe it'd be useful for him to know this. Ooh, jumping ahead. So you get a nice long report or hopefully a nice short report from the tester. It's got all the details about what the findings were, but make sure it's got a good summary as well. It shouldn't actually look like that. That's a joke, but... Um, Make sure that it's got a summary at the beginning. It should say exactly what was tested, how was it tested, what was included, what was found at a very high level. Because you can then go and show, on that, show that summary to other people, who, other stakeholders who might be interested, external customers who want to see evidence that you're secure, uh, managers who you need to justify what you need to do to. Um, and because of that, you want to make sure, you know, get the tester to do that job for you. They should be including that in their, in their report anyway. So make sure that you've decided to discuss with them up front and made sure that it's going to be you know, something you can show your customers, something you don't have to then rewrite to show other people. Something that's important there is the business impact. You want to make sure that the business impact is front and center of the executive summary because that's what the customers, that's what managers are going to be interested in. And you want to make sure that we've discussed that up front with the testers as well. Make sure they understand what is the real risk of this application. It could be that you have to test this application, but actually the data inside isn't very sensitive. But if someone compromises the application and gets access to the server, then they could access something else, and that is sensitive. Again, the impact, business impact has to reflect that. So obviously, the findings need to, be, need to be understandable, need to be actionable, but it should also have full information about, okay, how do you reproduce this issue? Step by step, what, did the, what does the tester do? How do they find this? How does it manifest itself? Ideally, as an attack scenario, you know, how would a real attacker utilize this? And even better, if you can use that and create a unit test out of that or put that into your CI system, and then next time this comes up, your tests will catch it. Or if it regresses, your tests will catch it, and hopefully it won't appear on the next report. And obviously, full reproduction information is going to be important for that. Does this issue come up once, or does this issue come up lots of times? You know, they may have given you one example in the report, but actually there are a thousand different examples across the application. You need to make sure that's clear from the finding, make sure you understand that from the finding. If you don't, you need to push back and ask them about it. Uh, make sure the recommendations are specific to your case. Make sure that they're relevant. Push back and say, look, this doesn't look like it's going to fit us. It doesn't look like it's going to fit our business. You need to be, uh, put a little more thought into this. So you've got your reports. It's got a list of findings. Findings have got severity. OK, so what, what are you going to do now? What are you going to do with these uh, findings? Ultimately, you need to address them somehow. You need to have a plan of how, what you're going to do with them. So it's unlikely that you're going to just go down the list of findings and say, OK, this is the most severe, I'm going to do that first. This is the least severe, I'm going to do that last. It may be that you have, say, medium risk findings, which are very easy to address. And you want to pick them off early on just to get rid of that risk from your, uh, so you're no longer concerned about it. And maybe you have a high risk finding that's going to take you several months, a year to fix, because it's a very complicated issue. So you want to take the report and you want to work with the testers and work with the internal teams to come up with an action plan. Okay, what, 
order we're going to do this in? What's our plan for actually addressing these? And you need, need the testers to articulate the severity, but you also need the internal team to say, okay, well, this is how, how difficult it's going to be to address this. Um, and if you do have that case where you've got a high-risk finding, a problematic finding that's actually going to be quite difficult, go to the test and say, look, you've given us some recommendations. They're going to take a long time. What short-term mitigations can we use to deal with this in the meantime? How can we cover ourselves for now so that while we fix this issue properly, we're covered, we're not left exposed? Um, and that should all be part of that plan. You know, we do the short-term recommendations now, we do the long-term recommendations later on down the line. Finally, like I said before, but I just want to emphasize this again. The tester sees this day in, day out. They see these issues. Ask them to help with the fixes as well. Now, obviously, they're not going to know exactly how the application works. They're not going to know exactly what problems the developers are facing or what exactly, you know, what the, what the flow is. They've definitely got the knowledge about where the, where the issue is, what the issue is caused by, what the best practices are for fixing it. We had a client where we discovered a CSRF vulnerability. And we reported it to them, and we gave them recommendations of how to fix. We even did a more in-depth document that explained you know, in great detail, here are different ways of fixing CSRF. Here's how we recommend you fix it in this case. And we said, look, we, we, you know, we'd love to sit with your developers and explain this and make sure it, it goes OK. And they said, no, no, it's fine, it's fine. We've got it covered. And we came back the next year, and they'd added CSRF tokens all over the application, but they weren't checking the CSRF tokens. So again, the problem, the issue came up at the same time. You know, this was not the worst case scenario. You know, they'd, they'd made a change, they made a fix, and it hadn't really made anything better, but it hadn't made anything worse either. Um, the worst case scenario is that you make a fix, but it breaks something else, or it makes the situation worse. I think there's definitely value to making sure that that fix gets done and utilizing the tester's knowledge. OK, so that's the idea from the reporting. So to sum up, like I say, three different stages. I think that even though I split it into these three areas, you may you probably want to think about all, all of these beforehand anyway. It's just more about where they come up in the process. Um, but yeah, if I suppose if you take away nothing else from this, then I suppose the, the key takeaways are as follows. I think transparency is key. Like we said, we're looking for value here. We're looking for the best possible test we can give in the shortest possible time, most efficient possible time. We don't have months to emulate a real attacker. The more the tester knows, the more informed activity, activities they can perform the more they know when they're actually going to do the test. Efficiency. We want to cut down on, on anything that's going to break efficiency. Ultimately, the testers sat there. They're focusing. They're trying to think about, OK, how could this work? They're looking at the code. They're going back to the application and saying, OK, how can, how can I cause this to go wrong? If they're having to break that concentration to look at daily reports or things stop working or the tool they wanted, they didn't sanitize, they didn't realize they're going to need it, and then they have to go and get it approved, um, it's, it's all hitting that efficiency. But ultimately, the main goal is to build that dialogue between the two sides. It shouldn't be something that we're knocking over the wall and then we're getting back up the wall. Um, the testers should be in dialogue with the developers, with the architects, so that the testers understand, well, OK, how is this working? What's going on? And the developers and the architects understand, OK, what are, the, what are the testers looking for? What are they interested in? Um, and yeah, I think that will lead to a better testing process. And um, yeah, hopefully, you can find some value for that. Um, thank you very much. Um, got time for questions? Um, over there? Um, if you, okay, so they said the question was, how do you, how do you sell the transparency piece? How do you convince clients about the transparency element and push, and prevent pushback about, well, it's not real if you're not, you're not really emulating an attacker if you do it white box? Um, so I find my clients don't have loads and loads of money. They don't want to spend, they don't want to test testing for months and months and months, but a real attacker has that time. Ultimately, we're not emulating a real attacker. If they, want, if they want to pay for a red team exercise, which is a possibility, then it's going to take a long time. It's going to take 
you know, weeks of reconnaissance like a real hacker would do. It's going to take a full scope. It's going to take in scope. Um, ultimately, we're just trying to, you know, if you want to really emulate a real attack, we can do that. But it's going to take a long time. It's probably not what the customer are looking for. Generally, the customer are looking to secure their product and get a uh, better level of security in their application. And I try and put it over in that way that, look, we're trying to time box this into a particular sp space of time. We need to decide how we're going to best use that time. OK. Um, okay, so you're asking, is it more difficult now with sort of microservices architecture and lots of different pieces talking to one another? Are you talking about challenging from the hands-on testing side or the understanding what's going on behind the scenes side? So in terms of going on what's going on behind the scenes, obviously it's a, it's a, it's a lot more challenging. But it's easier on particular areas. You can say, okay, um, where's this happening? Okay, well, this happens in this particular area. We can go and look at that particular element of code. Um, from the hands-on from the hands-on side, I mean, obviously, it's driven by the understanding of what's going on behind the scenes. But I think, ultimately, from the hands off, from the face of it, you don't necessarily see that complexity. Um, I think you, you may know it's going on behind the scenes, but ultimately, you, from the hands-on side, you're just seeing the face of the application. Um, and to me, that's the reason why it's important to get that transparency and to see to get that information about what's going on behind the scenes. Because you know, if it's, it is a microservices architecture, then it may be the load of stuff you're going to do at the front isn't relevant. So I think, in some ways, it makes it even more important to understand what's going on behind the scenes. Anything else? Any other questions? Okay, uh, I think we're done. Uh, thank you very much, everyone.